Good afternoon, everyone. The Waitley Historical Society is pleased to bring you this program that will help you understand why the street that we're on is called Chestnut Plain Road, even though there's a paucity of chestnut trees on the road. I'm aware of one way back in the back of the Center Cemetery. There's one in front of Nicholas Jones's house and across the street from his house. And there is, what is it, Allison, an Asian Chinese chestnut that you gave me this fall that's planted in front of our house, four houses down. But the big, tall chestnut trees of which you will see some pictures are long gone. And one of the reasons is that the cure to the blight, which left a lot of dead wood around in all of the Appalachian forests, the cure was to cut them all down. So there was a whole lot of lumbering, and you will see that before they died, there was a lot of lumbering as well in what the presenters will tell you. How it's a great story. But Allison and I, as she will describe, had the privilege of visiting in Colerain where there are three thickets of American chestnut trees about 15 years old, only a few of which are blight infected for reasons that we can't explain and the owner can't explain except that he said, these are offspring of a tree that was 70 feet tall when he had to figure out how to pollinate it because it was the only chestnut tree in his 300 acres of land, of about 250 acres of woods, they had to use bucket trucks and get up with paintbrushes and sprinkle the pollen on the flowers. They tried doing it with balloons filled with pollen that were towed by uh, drones but they popped the balloons by what, shotguns or something, and the rain of the pollen came down, but it didn't fertilize any of the nuts. Um, so they got up on bucket trucks and paint brushes and produced viable offspring, which we had the privilege of seeing. Who knows how blight resistant they are, but only a few of them showed clear infection of the blight. So maybe there's something resistant in the genes of that tree. But the roots of chestnut trees live for at least 100 years because if you go out in the Appalachian woods, there are little shrubs, sprouts of chestnuts from the roots of those trees that were killed by the blight, but the roots weren't killed. So they just keep sending up more shoots. So this is a story we'd like you to learn more about. The Waitley Historical Society has curated many aspects of Waitley history, not so many of its natural history. We've done more objects, we've done clothing, we've done documents, uh, various kinds of objects but this is an important part of Waitley uh, natural history. So I'm Neil Abram. I'm the current president of the Historical Society. We have four contributing speakers. Uh, and the first of those is Anne Lomely, who has investigated much of the narrative uh, that will get us started. And then we have three other speakers who will elaborate. So, Anne, please kick it off. My name is Anne Lomely, perhaps better known in this town as the daughter of Herbert and Connie Futter. When we moved here in the early 1960s, we found ourselves living on a street called Chestnut Plain Road. Even as a little girl, I wondered, Chestnut Plain Road? Where are the plain, where's the plain of chestnut trees? It's not that I was unacquainted with a chestnut street. My pediatrician's office in Springfield was on Chestnut Street, and I would scream bloody murder there before getting vaccinated. Each time we drive south or north on Route 91, 
between Hatfield and Waitley, we drive under Chestnut Street in Hatfield. Why are there so many names of streets with the word chestnut in them? Did you know that the word chestnut appears in enough street names in Massachusetts to make it the 12th most common street name in the state? What did happen to all the chestnut trees? It's taken me more than 50 years in the Waitley Historical Society, thank you, Neil, to learn the answer to that. <laughs> now I'm going to share what I, some of what I've learned. But to do so, we're going to have to time travel. Some millions of years back, in, and, and we're coming back to back and forth in 15 minutes. So hold on to your seats. First, though, I want to credit my primary source for this endeavor. And it's not the Time Machine by H.G. Wells, but rather The American Chestnut, an environmental history by Donald Edward Davis, with some other sources, such as the American Chestnut Foundation. Here we go. Once upon a time, about 90 million years ago, there was a family of trees that were the ancestors of all beech and oak species. These grew in the supercontinent that linked North America to Europe and Asia. That was called Laurasia. According to evolutionary biologists, chestnut trees evolved from closely related oak species near what are now the islands of Japan. Fossil evidence shows that these first plants of the Castania or chestnut genus appeared about 87 million years ago, but a tree resembling the modern species didn't evolve for another 22 million years. At that time, around 65 million years ago, there's evidence for what is known as the KT event. An asteroid hit Earth and led to the extinction of the dinosaurs and vast de devastation. You can read about that on NASA's website. Though scientists speculate that chestnut trees could have reached what is now North America by then, they say that the impact of the asteroid carbonized most of North America. Over time and due to fluctuating temperatures and isolation, Chestnuts in what is now Asia developed a new lineage closely related to the Chinese chestnut. And those near the western part of Laurasia became the progenitors of the European chestnut. Chestnut trees that lived on the part connecting Europe to North America evolved and became established just before Laurasia broke up, perhaps 45 million years ago. Those are the trees that spread across North America. And one of those was the American chestnut. Chestnuts then became common in the deciduous forests of the Northern Hemisphere, reaching their peak around five million years ago. They were found in places like the Rocky Mountains in northern Idaho. But as the climate cooled and glaciers began to cover North America, chestnuts vanished from the north of Europe, Asia, and North America. And some of the species became extinct, but not the American chestnut. Over the last 800,000 years, warming and cooling cycles happened at least eight times. At the peak of the last ice age, there were almost no American chestnuts living in what we think of as the tree's native range. At that time, the Laurentide ice sheet was three miles high in some places and covered parts of New England, New York, and beyond. There were alpine meadows and snow fields in as far south as Georgia. Hickories and evergreens covered northern Florida, and it was there that the American chestnut tree lived 25,000 years ago. Oh. <laughs> Scientists know this from fossilized plant pollen found in lakes and ponds and other places. The last major ice age ended about 21,000 years ago, and the Laurentide ice sheet began to retreat. By 18,000 years ago, the American chestnut started moving northward. How did they travel? <laughs> The usual suspects include squirrels, chipmunks, and mice, but blue jays, crows, and passenger pigeons transported the most chestnuts. Winds helped the pollination, and rain temperature and soil types were factors. The shift of the range northward averaged about 110 yards per year. It took 5,000 years for the trees to colonize what is now Georgia, and another 2,000 years before native peoples were eating chestnuts in the Tennessee Valley. They were likely important transporters of the chestnut further north also. By 1500 AD, the American chestnut tree range covered 400,000 square miles extending from southern Maine to southeast Louisiana. 
By then, the American chestnut tree was one of the most common species in the eastern deciduous forest. There's plenty of archaeological evidence that chestnuts were important food sources for native cultures. The trees produce more nuts than many other nut trees, and chestnuts are nutritionally excellent, containing all nine amino acids needed to make a complete protein. Robust stands of nut trees encouraged per permanent settlements of humans. Not only were the nuts a food source, but they also attracted animals for hunting. In the 1600s, Dutch travelers observed Algonquin wigwams constructed from the bark of chestnut trees. Cherokees used chestnut tree bark to roof their cabins in the 1700s. The Choctaws believed that when the earth was made by the creator, the chestnut was the first living thing brought forth. Other native cultures celebrated the big chestnut moon, and the chestnuts appeared to native, in native folk tales and place names. Colonists started using chestnut wood to make posts and rail fences in the 1600s. By the end of the 1600s, 20 million cords of firewood were annually harvested in eastern North America. Huh. Luckily for the chestnut tree, it was not considered desirable firewood. It didn't burn as hot as other woods, and uncured logs sparked a lot, creating a fire hazard for open fireplaces. So at that point, the chestnut tree continued to expand its range. During the 1700s, chestnut wood was used to construct homes and widely used for fence posts. Thomas Jefferson is reported to have used chestnut wood to construct Monticello and 8,000 chestnut rails just to enclose a 45-acre orchard. Huh. By the mid-1700s and into the 1800s, human activity was causing a reduction in the numbers of chestnut trees everywhere. The wood was now being used to make household items, including chairs, benches, shelves. It was also used to make charcoal for, for iron making. One ironworks property in New Jersey depleted a forest of 20,000 acres in 12 to 15 years, and chestnut trees were always in that mix. By this time, chestnut trees were being celebrated in writings, art, and song. Who remembers The Village Blacksmith by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, which begins with, under a spreading chestnut tree, the village smithy stands. When Henry David Thoreau moved to Walden Pond in 1845, chestnut trees were plentiful in the surrounding woodlands. He collected winter supplies of the nut. But by 1860, he lamented that the chestnut trees now sleep their long sleep under the railroad. In 1872, the New York Times reported on the importance of chestnuts in commerce, mentioning that chestnut roasters were found along all prominent thoroughfares Cookbooks of the period included recipes for chestnut stuffing, gravy, soup, chestnut balls for dessert, chestnut ice cream, and on and on. In 1885, there was a comic song called Chestnuts on the Brain. Of course, now is the season for chestnuts roasting on an open fire, the subtitle of the 1945 nostalgic song, the Christmas song. In the October 1915 edition, of American forestry, New England forester Philip, K. Philip L. Buttrick discussed the tree's importance to the U.S. economy. He wrote an article called Commercial Uses of Chestnut. I'm going to read an excerpt as quoted in Davis's book because I think it's a profound commentary. The tree serves as a shade and ornamental tree in our parks and estates. Its wood is used in the building and decoration of our houses and the manufacture of our furniture. We sit down in chairs made of chestnut and transact our business at desks of chestnut veneered with wood, with oak. We receive messages from the distance over wires strung on chestnut poles. We sit in a railroad train and read newspapers into whose composition chestnut pulp has gone, while our train travels over rails supported on chestnut ties and over trestles built of chestnut piles along a track where, whose right of way is fenced by wire supported on chestnut posts. On the same train travels goods shipped in boxes and barrels made of chestnut boards and staves. Even the leather from our shoes is tanned in an extract from chestnut wood. At last, when the tree can serve us no longer in any other way, it forms the basic wood to make our coffins. 
So what happened to the chestnut trees? By the later 1800s, commercial growers were crossbreeding European, Japanese, and Chinese chestnut trees with an American chestnut. They grafted the foreign varieties onto the American chestnut saplings. American chestnuts were preferred for flavor, but the foreign varieties were larger, making them more attractive in the view of the day. By the end of the 1800s, most commercial growers had abandoned cultivation of American chestnuts. By 1903, European and Japanese chestnut orchards were established in a dozen states over nearly 10,000 acres. Herman Merkel was the first chief forester of the New York Zoological Park, now known as the Bronx Zoo. In the summer of 1904, two-thirds of the park was covered with a mature forest of oak, chestnut, and hickory, and other trees. Merkel went to look at several diseased American chestnut trees that his groundskeepers had pointed out. He thought they'd been attacked by a common fungus, and he sprayed them with a fungicide. The following spring, he could see the problem was serious. Nearly every chestnut tree was infected. The park bordered on the New York Botanical Garden, and he asked William Merle of the garden to look at the trees. Merle was a noted mycologist specializing in North American plant fungi. fungi. He took samples and began growing and studying the fungus, but he couldn't identify it. He thought it was a new species. The disease manifested first in and under the bark, followed by blistering that then emitted millions of summer spores. Later, winter spores appeared, and both types were capable of reproducing and being distributed by the wind. The Bronx Zoo forester predicted that no American chestnut trees would be alive in the park in two years. He was right and large numbers of chestnut trees in the botanical garden were also dead. By 1907, the disease, known as the chestnut blight, had spread north to Poughkeepsie and south as far as Trenton, New Jersey. Then it spread further, even to British Columbia, Canada. In 1912, the chief plant pathologist at the USDA was asked how the blight could be in such remote places. He answered that the chestnut orchards contained Japanese chestnut trees. It was later determined that a Japanese chestnut at the New York Botanical Garden showed signs of the disease in 1906, though at the time Japanese chestnuts were thought to be immune. It took until 1915 to trace the likely origin of the blight to one or two specific nurseries in Japan, which sold rootstocks and twigs for grafting to multiple US buyers. Other factors weakened the chestnut trees, making them more susceptible to infection these included wood boring insects, cicadas, fires, the 1904 hurricane that damaged trees from Long Island to New Haven, and the widespread practice of grafting foreign trees onto American chestnut stumps. Politics didn't help, of course. Attempts in 1915 to impose more stringent quarantine requirements on interstate transport of the Japanese chestnut tree failed though the Plant Quarantine Act in 1912 limited and monitored foreign imports of plants, it was too late for the American chestnut tree. Nevertheless, use of chestnut wood continued unabated in the first two decades of the 20th century. Chestnut was used in the Northeast for making pianos and organs. Construction use continued. The flu pandemic of 1918 caused a significant increase in the need for coffins. Increasingly, the wood had to come from further south in the Appalachians. This led to the depletion of the tree even before it was hit by the blight. The Northeast was the first U.S. region to see significant chestnut losses, and by the early 1920s, the American chestnut tree was rare or gone completely. Throughout the 1920s, the blight moved south and devastated the trees. Efforts to find a cure was not effective. The loss of the American chestnut tree didn't just impact humans in a multitude of ways, but it dramatically affected wildlife as it was a significant food source for many creatures, including insects. It changed the ecosystems of forests. It's a dramatic example of how human intervention and consumption can have catastrophic event effects. Now let's return to the present and Chestnut Plain Road and the next part of the presentation, Allison. Good afternoon, everybody. There's some show and tell up here on the stage uh, that you can explore uh, after, after we're done talking. 
There are some press samples of Chinese chestnut and American chestnuts that you can compare that were done uh, this summer. There are two chestnut beams from Waitley Barns or buildings. Uh, you can explore the wood. That's a thanks to uh, Mike Dennehy who got these samples and even did a cross section and, and sanded some down so you can see the grain in the wood. Um, that will help you if you have barns or houses where you think you might have chestnut. This is a good way to take a look at it. And then there's some Native American artifacts on the end there. Um, Anne was talking about indigenous people and nuts. There certainly was a very strong nut culture. These are stones that were used to crack nuts. And you can go and take a look at those and even take a whack at a hickory nut if you want. Uh, there's some in a bowl there. So when we decided to do this topic, uh, I think we were talking about it in the summer, uh, various uh, members of the Historical Society kind of fanned out to explore different aspects of chestnuts. Uh, there were rumors of, oh, I know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody whose dog sitter has seen an American chestnut on a mountain somewhere in town. A couple of us went in search of uh, mature uh, American chestnuts, and there are still American, live American chestnuts in town. They, as far as we know, within Waitley, do not reach that mature uh, phase that they can reproduce. They stump sprout like this one. This is from Swamp, along Swamp Road in Waitley. Doesn't get much taller than me, or Jonathan maybe. Um, uh, but they still maintain, the blight is still with them, and they come up and live for a couple of years. The blight kills them, and then they sprout again from the stumps. The stump sprouting is a very strong feature of this species, and it is one of the things that made them uh, very practical for growing as second growth, third growth, multiple growth for fence posts and telephone poles and things where you need long, straight, fast-growing poles. So you can find stump sprouts still in Waitley, but we are still in search of a mature tree. So if you're a person who's out in the woods and uh, the best time to look for these things is in the fall because you might see the nut cases on the ground, uh, keep your eyes open because it's not impossible that there is one out there and it just has not been spotted. So as Anne was saying, a lot of the chestnut culture, and my explorations are local and within town, have to do with the food aspect of the trees. These are chestnuts. These are Chinese chestnuts, but they look very similar to what the American chestnuts would look like, the dark brown, shiny nut capsules within a very unfriendly burr casing. If anybody's ever tried to pick one of these up, it is sharper than needles, I swear. But they're very distinct, so if you do see one on the ground in the forest, you'll know what you're looking at. Those are chestnuts. So the Native Americans all over, but certainly here, were very connected to the nut crop. Not just chestnuts, but walnuts, hickory nuts, other nuts. And we know this uh, several ways. We know this from the lithic material tools that they've left behind. Up here is what is called a nut stone, and you'll see it's a flat rock that has pits in it, uh, depressions that are meant you seat your nut in there so that it will, when you smash it with the rock on top, it won't go flying out to the side. Um, you'll see there's the bottom stone there and then there's the two top stones there. But this was both for nutritional reasons very important, but also because of its storage aspect. These are, this is a food that comes with its own packaging and in a time before plastic or refrigeration or anything in that way of technology, uh, having, and if you ever had black walnuts, you know they will keep inside that shell for just about ever and ever. You practically can't get in them. But chestnuts and other nuts stored really well. And having a food source that you could maintain through winter, super important. Um, so that made this a very attractive food. This is an excerpt from deed to part of Deerfield that was signed in 1666 by a Native American named Chalk, who was dealing with John Pynchon, whose name comes up all the time because John Pynchon was running around buying up all kinds of land uh, on behalf of the English. Um, but this is an excerpt from the deed that Chalk crafted with John Pynchon, in which he reserves, Chalk reserves rights to hunt and use water and fish, but he specifically spells out he wants to be able to still gather walnuts and chestnuts and other nuts. Well, that tells you something about how important that was. Uh, uh, most of the chestnuts that I've seen in my local rambles 
are on Pecumtuck Ridge is a really great place to find chestnut sprouts. That's a classic place where the chestnuts would have been at home, um, drier, upland, rocky kind of soil. Um, so if you're ever up on that Pecumtuck Ridge Trail, keep your eye open, especially in the fall, you can spot the leaves. Um, there's quite a few chestnut sprouts up there. So I uh, went snorkeling around in the local uh, newspaper sources to see how chestnuts were being bought and sold and, and how they were connected to the local economy. Uh, these are two ads for land sales, and it's listing the attributes of the property, houses and pastures and orchards and chestnut timber. Very important thing to put on your house hunter list. You need uh, the, the twin vanities and a separate garage, but you also need your chestnut uh, timber uh, because, of, because of all the resources that that uh, supplied. One is from 1807 in Deerfield and the other is from um, by William Thayer in uh, Williamsburg, not, not too far from uh, West Whateley. Some of us have been exploring the account books by the Sanderson family who lived on what's now Glen Road and had mills on Roaring Brook in the north part of town. There are generations of account books by these people and this is an excerpt from one done by Elon Sanderson in 1818, which is quite early. Um, and you can see he's in the, he's making cider, he's, he's carting wood, wool, um, and he is sawing lumber for people. So he's making his living by processing wood for people. And right there in the middle, you can see he's got a note there, he's done 272 feet of chestnut timber at $1 per hundred feet. It's the most expensive wood that's on there because it's also listing hemlock and white pine and I believe maple, which are all about half the price. And I'm very curious about why the chestnut would have been twice as expensive. I have, I, if anybody has any ideas, I, I can't imagine it's that much harder to saw, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting fact. So here it is being processed in Waitley by a, a Waitley family uh, very early on. Various historical society people went out in search of barns and uh, standing evidence of chestnut beams. We heard from Paul Newland that his house has chestnut in it. These are two other examples. Bill O'Bear's barn on Weber Road has timbers from, I think, very early 18th century barn that he had. So those are timbers from quite early on, hand-hewn, you can see, that are still being used in this refurbished barn that he has on Weber Road. And then the other, another barn on Weber Road, the Judson Barn, which you can drive right by and you can look right in, is full of chestnut beams. And a piece of one of those, Judson gave us permission to take a piece, is right here on the stage and you can check that out. And the other one is from Quanquant Farmer's Farmhouse, which was uh, uh, in the floor of our farmhouse. So I suspect it's all over the place in the older houses in town if you knew what you were looking for and had a chance to look. So it's still with us and it's still holding buildings up today, um, which is pretty interesting. Here's a newspaper survey of different uses for chestnut. The, Anne mentioned the charcoal. There's somebody wanting 2,000 bushels of chestnut charcoal. It must have been a very good fuel for early industry. The Russell Company in Greenfield in the 1840s was buying chestnut, specifying chestnut charcoal in that early time. This is before, I believe, we had access to very much coal. Chestnut shingles, this is a wood that splits really easy. We have the railroad, the earliest railroad, which was the West, called the Western Railroad, which went from Springfield through Westfield, they advertised for chestnut timbers for their rails. Uh, here it is for the, on the lower left here for the Connecticut River Railroad between Northampton and Greenfield, and that's certainly us. We would have had chestnut ties all up and down the railroad, all up and down through town. Those are long gone, I'm sure, because we also invented creosote. At once upon a time, those were local chestnut logs that made that first railroad space. And uh, here's a furniture maker, and I mentioned furniture maker. This is Elihu Strong in Northampton, listing all the things that he makes and uses chestnut wood for very early on. I just love, this is my favorite thing that I discovered along the way. This is, this is my little chestnut treasure. This is Elon Sanderson's account book again, and now it's 1851. He kept decades of account books. They were very busy people. But at the bottom of the page right here is this entry. And he's recording that on January 21st, 1851, he cut a chestnut tree that was five and a half feet across at the butt in his north woods. So this is in Waitley, or maybe just across the Conway line, but close enough 
So big and so long, 55 feet long, it took five yokes of oxen to drag it out of the woods to the mill. Th picture that. Who could do that kind of thing? Who could cut that down? He didn't have a chainsaw. So there it is, evidence of a very big tree still standing in 1850. So that would have been a first generation, you know, first growth chestnut still standing then. By 1851, a lot of this town was starting to be cleared and many of the original chestnuts would have been cut and maybe another generation coming up or two generations coming up, they're still alive. Uh, but the first generation trees were un uncommon enough that he made a note of this in his thing. Went looking through the herbarium record, the botanical record for chestnuts. And on the left here is a specimen from Emily Dickinson's very famous herbarium because it's been published in a very fancy book. Uh, but she like many, many other young women of her time botanized and collected herbarium specimens as a way to study science, the artistic, it's a way for them, an okay way for women to go out in the natural world and um, have, a, have a, an activity and a hobby. But this is a chestnut leaf that she collected. It must have been local. She was not wandering, you know, all over the place. In the 1840s, it's a beautiful leaf, Paul. It's got that really classic wave crest pattern to it. She did a nice job. And you can tell it she collected it when the plant was in flower. So that must have been midsummer sometime. But then in 1913, the New England Botanical Co Club made a special effort. They were collect collecting from uh, specific places around the state, and they identified uh, Waitley and the Mill River Valley as a place they wanted to collect from. Uh, they came, and 1913 is a big year because by then, certainly the people of the Botanical Club would have been very acutely aware that these trees were on their way out. And so someone from the Botanical Club found a specimen in 1913 in Waitley, and it is still, there it is, still with us, still saved um, in their herbarium. The age of photography came upon us, and these trees were grand enough and expressive enough that they were worth capturing by photographers and their giantness. And this is one that Maida and I found uh, many years ago in the William College archives working on another project. But this is a chestnut tree in winter. It shows you the shape of this tree. It's just amazingly beautiful. But what I find interesting too in this picture is note the fencing along underneath it, probably made of chestnut. So you've got chestnut a couple different ways. Chestnut squared going on here. But what a tree that is. And these are photos from the historic Northampton collection, which has a photo photographer named uh, Frederick Neeland, who took many local photos around the turn of the century. These are two magnificent photos of the trees in bloom, and especially this one on the right. Look at the flowers on this thing. And imagine a hillside where it's half, at least half the trees are chestnut trees, and it's July, August, and the whole hillside must have looked like snow. I'm not sure how well it smelled, you know. I never liked the smell of chestnut trees, so I'm not sure I want a whole hillside of them. But if you could get it beyond the smell and just, just the way that the hillsides must have looked then, that's pretty staggering. So it's nice to see those. Our friend Winslow Homer uh, did a couple of different engravings of uh, chestnut-related activities because by the end of the 19th century, this is an activity that's no longer just a survival kind of food situation, but a romantic kind of situation and a recreational opportunity. You would go chestnutting with your friends and your family. It was a, like, like leaf peeping and you know, flower watching. It was a thing that you went out and did that was evocative of, of older times and uh, so worth, worthy of Winslow Homer putting it in uh, one of the weekly journals. But this is Clifton Johnson's photo. He was, lived in Hadley and spent a lot of time on the Holyoke Range. This is a photo he calls boys going chestnutting. And there they are setting off with their sacks for the day to go do that. So here we are, uh, Chestnut Blight arrives in the valley. As Anne said, it got started in the uh, aughts, five, six in New York, but it didn't really make the headlines around here un until for 10 years later. And then the papers start to be filled with reports about chestnuts. Whaley not having a newspaper, we don't have our own report about it. I searched the tree warden reports for town and there is no mention of chestnut blight for some reason, or I couldn't find it. Whaley's tree warden is, becomes aware of the gypsy moth problem in the 20s and 30s, and then the Dutch elm disease in the 50s is a thing, but I could not find anything about the chestnut blight in particular. But in this chestnut blight article about Sunderland, down here, it gives some percentages that were observed in various towns. 
Sunderland they're calling out because it's saying 50% uh, of their trees have been affected. But down the bottom, Waitley, 30 to 40%. And of course, it just got worse. But that's a lot of trees, so it was, it was aware. And then by 1919, as if the world hadn't had enough problems by then with the flu and the war and whatever else, chestnuts were considered pretty doomed and probably weren't coming back. And here's another Clifton Johnson photo that he took on Uncomonk Hill in Williamsburg. And I'm sure he took this because, not because he thought it was a pretty dead tree, but because this is a tree killed by blight and he's recording that loss of that grand tree. So in Waitley, there are, as I said, I've gone out and seen living chestnuts. This, is, this pretty well shows it, small understory tree, and you can see the dead branches just at the top. That's the, the, the last generation that was killed and died back. And this is a new stump sprout. God knows how many times this has sprouted you know, since 1913, a lot. But it continues to go. And as I say, you can find these things, and it's somewhat poignant and to, to look for them, to keep your eyes open. And then this is a picture from the event, that, the trip that Neil described, where we were in touch with a man from Conway who had a mature chestnut tree that was discovered in his woods in, the, I think, the 90s. It might have been the 80s. Big tree, he called it his mother tree. And these are the offspring that were generated from that tree that are still going strong. I think he's still waiting for them to create viable nuts, but they have not, most of them have not died back or been affected by the blight. And they're actually, it's, it's, it's the tree on the right there. So you can see it's a good 20 something feet tall. They still seem to be carrying on. All right, so I'm gonna turn it over to Paul Wetzel, who is from the McLeish Station in West Whateley, Smith College's McLeish Station, and he is the one who's been directing their chestnut uh, program, trying to create blight-resistant chestnuts. Hello, everybody. My name is Paul Wetzel, and I am the manager at uh, the McLeish Field Station. And one of the things that we've been doing there in the, in the last 11 years is we have a seed orchard for, um, American, to look for American chestnut hybrids. So part of that seed orchard at McLeish is actually sponsored by or in coordination with the American Chestnut Foundation. And the American Chestnut Foundation is a not-for-profit organization that is, that's their mission, to return the chestnut back to the, um, its range in North America. You may have heard of it. They have state chapters all the way across the eastern part of the country, and, um, and they rely a lot on volunteers. In fact, I think, I bet there's only probably 50 or 75 people that work for the American Chestnut Foundation. The rest of the people are um, volunteers. But this, um, this picture is a picture from, this is a picture of chestnuts from down south in, Appala in the southern part of uh, Appalachia Mountains. And there's a person, and there's another person over there. They were huge. They're huge. The, old, the first trees were just giants, and they were, they were referred to as the sequoias of the east. Um, so, but uh, we've heard and talked about this, about the range. The range of chestnuts, it's the dark green in this map. It went from southern Maine and kind of blotched through and then all across the, um, down through the mountains down to northern Alabama, Mississippi. It was uh, a very, very common tree in the range. There's some discussion in the science literature about how many trees there were. We don't know. We don't know how many trees, how many chestnut trees were there. But it's estimated that one in every four trees in the forest was a chestnut, so about 25%. It could be more in some areas, could be less in um, others. Um, they could be really, really large. And here's some people that are actually in a little kind of burnt out part or um, rotted out part of a chestnut tree. This has been emphasized by both of the speakers. This was a very, very important tree for so many reasons to both people and animals. It can't, you just can't emphasize that enough. It was extremely important. And it's for all the reasons that people have said, for timber and all the things you can do with wood as food source for animals, 
many of those animals that people would eat. People would eat the nuts themselves. Chestnuts give a very consistent um, nut production year after year after year. And they, they, don't, they don't act like oaks where you get amassed maybe every three years, big, where you almost feel like you're rolling around on marbles sometimes. Yeah, that's, chestnuts are very consistent. Um, they also, from the bark and things, you can get tannins um, from them. So it was just really very important. It shows up in fine art. <laughs> Here's a Francis, um, John Francis painting. You can see this in the Boston MFA. And it's a still life for, you know, what, he got tired of painting portraits, so he started doing still life so he didn't have to drive around to see people. But it's just reflective of abundance. And, and you know, the, the chestnuts are there, and they're sprawled all over the table, and that's just a fall abundance, along with cider and apples, right? So, and culturally, you know what color that is, and you know what color someone who has chestnut colored hair, what that means. You know that, you know that automatically. And you also know, as Anne pointed out, the song, chestnuts roasting on an open fire. You know that, you just know it. It's very iconic. Um, it's just hard to, it's hard to even imagine, but it's still there. But as Anne mentioned, um, in 1904, there was, they found it in New York City. They found this blight that had been brought over. It's a fungus. And this is a map that shows how it spread. And so you can just see the little red lines kind of are like contours of spread and they represent different time zones. And so it spread first right around New York City, then it spread up north into uh, sort of northeast and then it and over to Pennsylvania. By 1930, it was in Virginia, West Virginia. And by 1940, it was down in Tennessee. And by 1950, it had gone all the way to the southern part of the region. And so, like I said, we don't really know how many trees there were to start with, and people have been cutting them down and everything. So it's hard to know exactly, but some people estimate that there were four billion trees that were killed in that 50 year period. I don't know, that just seems like an awful lot of trees, four billion. So we've just gone through a pandemic and I'm not making the, the struggles of the last, the most recent pandemic. I'm not um, making, you know, suggesting that wasn't difficult. But if you divide four billion by 50 years, you get 80 million trees dying every year. It's a huge amount. So even if we're wrong and it was 20 million trees dying every year, it's a lot of trees. Um, and they just, they just kind of became this ghost of a tree. It was a significant event culturally and for the forests to have that prominent of a plant drop out of the forest in what is a very fast time in terms of evolution and how ge geology, 50 years is nothing. So what's the problem? The problem was this fungus, Cryphonectra parasitica. What it does is it, so all trees, uh, the cell division on a tree, as it, as it grows wider and wider, occurs in, in one thin layer just underneath the bark. Really, it's about two or three cells wide and that's where cell division occurs and that's how trees get bigger and bigger. And um, that's called the cambrium layer. And it's in this picture, it's kind of probably right in, eh, it's right in here, that area. Um, and what happens, if you've ever girdled a tree, taken a hatchet and went around a tree and chopped just maybe half an inch into the wood all the way around, the tree dies. Sometimes people take a chainsaw and they do the same thing. Just, they don't cut the tree down, but they just cut around it. This is essentially what this fungus does, is it girdles the tree. And you can see, this is what it looks like. If you wanna see what this looks like, you can come to McLeish and look at, the, there's lots of it there in the chestnut orchard. It produces these orange, kind of orange cankers. And so water can't come up from the roots and photosynthesis that's made in the, in the leaves can't come down to the roots. 
So that's why the tree dies everywhere there's a canker that goes all the way around. The tree dies everything above. But it's not killing the tree per se. So the roots are still alive, which is why you can see from Allison's photos, you can see um, chestnut trees. They, you know, they, they, they get a certain age. Really, they get a, um, an age so that where their bark starts to fissure just a little bit, and it's an entrance point for the fungus, and then that's when they start dying. So maybe they'll live five or six years, and um, then they're, they're old enough to get those fissures, and then they die. This is a map that shows that there's still a lot of surviving chestnuts. The darkest brown is where the highest density of stems are found. As the colors get lighter is where the density becomes less and less. But even now, some of the stems in, look at, it's right in Massachusetts area and then in the Appalachian area. Even now, we're talking about two and a half to six and a half thousand stems per square kilometer. I mean, that's just, that's a lot of stems. You can, you can do it. Um, you can see that it was, it was very common because of the nature of the fungus and everything, what we say is now that American chestnuts are not extinct, but they're functionally extinct. They can't reproduce anymore. Or when they do, they don't have other trees around them so much to um, spread their pollen and that sort of thing. Like Allison said, the flowers have a real strong scent. They're pollinated by insects and they have these burrs that are very, very sharp. And there are four cousins to the chestnut family, and <laughs> there's an American, and there's Chinese, and there's European and Japanese. And the Americans have the smallest nuts, but they have the sweetest ones, and you can see the nuts get progressively bigger for the different kinds of trees. Just to make a comparison, there's a lot of Chinese chestnuts around, this is Chinese tree um, characteristics. First of all, it has a canoe shape and this kind of breaking wave. And the twigs are hairless and they can be kind of brown. They can be greenish brown too. And these are the buds for next year and they'll be smooth and pointed. Compared to the Chinese chestnut, they're cousins. You can tell when you're there, you, you, you look at them and you say, this looks like a chestnut, but not really. Not quite, but yeah, so it doesn't have that point at the bottom as much, so it's not quite as elongated. And you can definitely see there's a, the hairs are a lot more prominent in, on the stems and even a little bit on, on the petiole of the leaf. And the twigs are not brown and they tend to be a pea green. But there's lots of little variations. So trees, just like people, are different. We're all people, but they, they don't all look the same. So, so um, yeah, and you just compare them. The other thing that's different about the um, American chestnut is, well, yes, it's not resistant to the blight. <laughs> that's true. But it tends to be a canopy tree, like an oak. It's going to be out. It would be grow up and be a canopy tree. And as opposed to a Chinese chestnut, will be smaller, 40 to 60 feet, and maybe even multi-stemmed. The next couple slides are about the American Chestnut Foundation and what their plan is and that sort of thing. Um, the Chestnut Foundation was started in the 80s. Uh, it, was, it was an attempt to bring back this uh, tree, like I said, and they tried, they were gonna, in the 80s, they decided to do a um, what's called the Burnham Plan. It's after a guy named Burnham. And he, uh, the goal was they were going to create a hybrid um, uh, chestnut that would be blight resistant. And we're kind of 40 years into that. And I'll just, I'll just uh, ruin the whole story. It's not working, okay? Spoiler. Um, <laughs> spoiler, yeah, that's right. So um, it's not working, and so, um, and I can tell you why in a minute. So just recently, in the last five years, the Chestnut Foundation came out with a, what they call their three burr strategy. It's called for breeding, biocontrol, and biotechnology united for restoration. 
what does that mean? Well, breeding is this, what, what they've been doing for a while. And what's happened is, is that what you, what you do is you take a Chinese and an, an American and you cross them. And just like you have 50% of the genes of your mother and 50% of the genes of your father, this offspring has 50% American and 50% Chinese. The thing is, when they came up with this scheme, they thought, well, we want nice, big, towering, tall trees. We want trees that are more American than Chinese, not just half and half. So what they're hoping when you cross is that this offspring has carried the resistance, the genetic resistance, with it. But that, doesn't, that isn't true always, right? Um, because you, you don't know, and you, you, you don't know unless you can get a map, so to speak, um, of, the, of the genome of, of the uh, offspring. So, um, so you can say that some of them are going to have it, or some of them will have partial resistance, or some of them will not have resistance at all. So, what they, so then they kept going and they said, okay, we're going to take that first offspring and we're going to back cross it with an American because we want more American genes. We want it to be a big tree. And that works, but you have to then know, you have, you have to, now you have even less chance that you got all the, the um, genes that will, that will provide resistance. And they said, well, it's not even good enough. We want to get to 94%. So they kept back crossing it. And every time you have to make sure that your offspring from those crosses carries the genetic um, material that will give them resistance. And you, they could never know that. They're looking at it. Oh, it didn't die. Okay, it didn't die. All right, let's, let's take it. And as it turns out, as it turns out that it was, it's very difficult to know whether the uh, resistance has been passed on. And so after 40 years, you get some trees are great, some trees are not, but they've been going around and t using microbiology techniques and looking at how much resistance, how much um, American genome, look at an individual, how much of American genes do they have, how much Chinese, and they're finding out that in some orchards, a lot of trees that were thought to be way along the process Nah, they're almost practically all American. So it hasn't worked very well. It just hasn't been consistent. And if we go, if you go to uh, McLeish, and you're welcome to walk around there um, and go up to the hill and there's, this, <laughs> there's, a, um, there's a whole bunch of trees. You can't miss it. It looks like an orchard, it looks like that. Um, you can go and you can look and you can see, uh, yeah, this one, has, this one has a huge canker, this one has a huge canker, this one has a huge canker. But there's, a, there's about three right now um, that do not have too many cankers, or the ones they do, they manage to seal it off and, they, and they, um, it doesn't kill them outright. So there's actually, we might get lucky. And then there's a whole corner of the, of the orchard that looks like there's a bunch of little trees. And those haven't been tested yet. So um, they're just too young. They're just not big enough to test. Because we could, because you, if, you, if you test them too early, you'll kill them for sure. So that's the breeding part of the three burr program. The other one is biocontrol. And what that means is there is a virus that kills the fungus. <laughs> it's a cruel world out there, let me tell you. It's a really cruel world. Um, but there's always someone that wants something that wants to eat you, yes. Um, so, uh, so there, there is some work being done on seeing if you, there is a way you could use the virus to um, inoculate uh, trees that were infected and make them heal. And this is, this is a tree that is not resistant to the fungus, but it has a virus that has been introduced into it. And so it has, has a canker, but it's not lethal. It's man, the tree can manage. And then there's biotechnology. Biotechnology can be used in several ways. One is to actually try to use it to select, rather than using visual cues or um, having, this is what we do, we actually go up to the tree that's being challenged. That's a polite way of we're, we might be killing it. Um, and um, we put a little, um, 
we put a little notch in the bark and then we take some of the fungus from a petri dish and put it into that hole and then we put some masking tape over it and that's how we challenge it and then we wait a year did it die mm. and did it no no you know so that's so if you didn't have to wait if you didn't have to wait seven years for the tree to grow up and then wait another year for it to figure out if it's you know going to die and if it doesn't die then you challenge it with a more virulent strain of the blight so you wait another year do the same thing and then wait another year um, then if you might you might be able to use biotechnology to just say hey does it have some key genes if it does all right good we don't have to challenge it and wait all this time we can just take a little leaf clip and check it out so you could save time that way that's partly what they're looking at and also looking to see where is the resistance on the genome because it turns out that it's a lot it's there is a lot more to the resistance at least genetically than they first thought they first thought it was only on three genes and you only had to worry about that now they know it's on nine and there could be more so it's not something that you just has you know, there's one single gene and you turn it on or off it's it's more complicated as you might gather just because that's the way the world is but there's also a group at SUNY Syracuse that has actually created a genetically modified organism this is a point of some controversy with some people not everybody but um, and the, they've they've introduced a gene that's just described as OXO it's a, a gene from a wheat plant and what it does is it prevents a type of acid called oxalic acid from um, occurring and that provides that's part of the um, that's part of what happens when the fungus attacks the tree it it starts there starts producing this oxalic acid and it, and it it kills the tree and so they've inserted it into the genome of um, trees uh, chestnuts and found that they can get good results really good results not silver bullet but they can get good results so the only catch with this is this sounds like oh okay maybe you don't have a good opinion of GMOs which is fine but the, but there is a catch and that is these individuals will be essentially they're all the same and you've got to be careful you can't have a giant population that has all this diverse genetic material it all dies down to a a fraction of the population and then start to work on use that use that genetic material and and start to build a population again you have to be very very careful um, to keep that genetic diversity because there are other things that are important like how well can you handle droughts or other diseases or whatever so um, so this is that that's why this group is very interested in working with the uh, um, chestnut foundation because the Chestnut Foundation, in using the Burnham plan that I described earlier, they did retain a lot of genetic <coughs> material because they have, they're just using individual plants that have all sorts of, um, of that genetic material there. So that's, that's the third B. And if you are interested in becoming a uh, member, you can go to the American Chestnut Foundation. The other thing you could do is you could plant American chestnuts and if you don't expect to get big trees because you won't but you could plant them and treat them like bushes and they do produce nuts all right so um, with that I'll be happy to answer any questions or just mill around afterwards okay <laughs> oh okay all right yeah. I'm gonna do a quick talk through um, my farm over in Sunderland across the river. I, I have a background as an ecologist and a forest biologist. Uh, I studied at SUNY ESF, the old forestry college. My business regenerative design group is out of Greenfield and we do design and planning, land management, soil health, tree crops, regenerative agriculture kind of stuff. And my take is that the, the chestnuts, it's a total calamity and a tragedy but it's also important to take the long term and think, think more longer term than we as a culture are used to. And uh, that we, we know um, these kind of 
uh, diseases have swept through uh, through the ecosystem. And for instance, that um, um, the pollen record shows the uh, eastern hemlock died out uh, or died back severely somewhere around 5,000 years ago. It just drops out of the pollen record. And then over the next se several thousand, took several thousand years to come back. And this is the way ecosystems work. So even though we're part of the problem at this point, spreading diseases and moving plants and species around, um, you know, the long view says that the, the ecosystem, if we could get out of the way or, or be a positive part of it, would um, um, come and restore a lot of these pieces. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the farm. We're just down uh, 47 south of the center of Sunderland at the old uh, Riverland Farm. Many of you all probably remember Riverland Farm. And we develop, are developing this farm as a kind of a demonstration, but also a part of this larger movement of bringing back chestnut as a food in our culture, as a, a food source, because it is such an amazing food. Uh, we're growing uh, these hybrid species, mostly Chinese, but there tend to be the varieties that we're growing tend to be these very complex mixes of the different species, including uh, Chinese, Japanese, European, American, and some of the chinkapin species as well. Uh, so there's been a lot of breeding over the last, uh, well, 100 plus years, but in, even in the last several decades have been massive improvements or huge improvements that have led to um, some um, growth in the possibilities of growing chestnuts. All right, so here's the field. It's about seven, seven and a half acres. And what we're doing is a particular kind of agriculture, perennial cropping called alley cropping, which is we have the, the trees in rows and between the rows are small fruit. So that is currant, there's elderberry, and there's aronia also growing. So there's small fruit growing between the rows, utilizing that space in the years before the trees are large and casting more shade. So we're, so we're creating this kind of succession. In the south um, portion of the field, there's uh, um, chickens grazing underneath the trees. And we did a little bit of an experiment showing the um, difference in the soil health with the chickens on one side and the, um, the alleys with the small fruit on the other side. And we've got some other stuff going in addition to hedgerows with uh, um, a lot of hazelnuts and mulberry and diversified species to kind of experiment with other crops as well. All right, let's go on to the next one. And so see a little bit of uh, um, the growth of the trees. Uh, there's my son who's about six feet tall. So the trees are already in, this was year five, and the trees are five to eight to 15 or so feet. They're coming into production. They have been selected to come into bearing sooner, and they're quite healthy on that soil there. So I mentioned the small fruits. So there's the elderberries, a little bit of harvest of the flowers on the left, aronia, which we're harvesting, processing, and as full berries and selling them as frozen whole berries. Uh, with some value added at the farm in Sutherland, we have a building that we're developing into some small processing. So we'll probably be doing value added with syrups and other things. And that's actually goji berry in the center there. So always trying out different kinds of things that could grow and see how well they do, but probably not gonna do that commercially. So just a quick little bit about chestnuts as this emerging agricultural crop. So there's the restoration of the American chestnut, which I think is really important work, but there's also the growth of utilizing the blight resistant chestnuts that we have growing for decades in this country. And that could be part of a really important part of our food system, both for farm viability that we know that farms could actually earn money and help improve the viability of the farms that are here, but also provide a staple crop and reduce our dependence on importing wheat, corn. It's, uh, I don't know if it has been mentioned, nutritionally, chestnuts are a carbohydrate. They're 
85% carbs, it's, a, it's very little oil, very little protein, but they have some other nutrients like vitamin C in them. Uh, so it could be a really good part of our diet grown here within our area and within our region. Some statistics on chestnuts. So we're the only country that can grow chestnuts, but we don't have a commercial industry. Uh, we import millions of dollars worth of nuts annually, mostly from Europe and Italy. Uh, there are approximately 3,700 acres of chestnuts in production in the U.S. And we need thousands of acres to just supply what we eat right now, which the U.S. diet is, I think, a tenth of a pound per person per year, which is like incredibly low for the global average. I think mostly Europe, it's a, a pound or more. And in parts of Asia, it could be five to 10 pounds per person per year. So we're talking about a huge potential here to provide the food that we eat just currently. Um, and right now, this is from a few years ago. Uh, I said there's 20 acres in chestnuts, uh, including my seven and a half acres down the road here. Um, there's probably more now because there's a lot of planting happening. There's a lot of excitement. There's um, hundreds, probably thousands of acres going in across the U.S., um, the big in the Midwest and Missouri, um, in the north, um, northern parts of the Midwest. Chestnuts need well-drained, acidic soil and full sun, the bottom line. And then a few images from our roasting during the harvest season, a pop-up market at the farm, roasting chestnuts and just celebrating the fact that we can have this food source here and it's seasonal and it's good food and nutritional. This was our second year in October that we had a little chestnut festival. It's gotten up to be hundreds of people and we're doing demos and of different kinds of nuts and um, different ways to cook, bringing cooks in and cooking different dishes and showing people what can be done with chestnuts. So it's really happening. This is current. This is a part of our culture from the past, but it's happening right now as well. We're getting some publicity. I just wanted to put this up. Pretty nicely written article by the fellow from CISA. And then a few years ago about silvopasture. And silvopasture is where you're combining the trees with livestock and you're getting the multiple benefits of this kind of integrated farm system. So there's a lot of excitement about that too, uh, with trying out different things. I mentioned that we had chickens in the understory, but there's people who have sheep uh, and even cattle who are, who are grazing um, livestock with the trees um, and getting combined benefits. So thanks a lot and uh, uh, Thank you.